Hi everyone, this is Abhimanyu Prakash from NACTAV's Global Designing Cities Initiative and I'm going to talk about metrics and evaluation and the power of interim transformation to all of you. NACTAV or the National Association of City Transportation Officials is an organization based in North America and it was designed and planned by city staff for the city staff in this part of the world. And what we work towards is to inspire and share solutions between city agencies, facilitate peer-to-peer -peer learning and knowledge sharing. A very big part of our work has been to produce design guidance over the years. And one of the most popular ones is of course the Urban Street Design Guide, which some of you might have seen. Our chair, Jeanette Sadiq Khan, who was the former transport commissioner for New York City, launched the Global Arm, GDCI, or Global Designing Cities Initiative, as we like to call it, in 2014. We have been working under the Bloomberg Initiative for Global Road Safety since then. And one of the first pieces that we worked upon was the Global Street Design Guide an assimilation of global best practices and tools to design your streets for road safety and for sustainable mobility. I'm going to be sharing more from this book going forward, but just to talk a little bit more about it, this was created with input from 40 countries and 70 cities and has been made a free download for people to use. This document has been endorsed by over a hundred cities and organizations globally, including several cities in India, and has been translated into multiple languages for wider outreach. The idea behind the document and our work is to inspire leaders to see what's possible in their streets, to inform practitioners about the global best practices and empower communities about what to ask for. And the basic premise has been to flip this age old pyramid where car has been king to put people first, people of all ages and abilities on top, followed by public transportation, cycles, and then our city services and cars. We know that most of the streets all around the world have been built and it's important that we put on a new set of lenses to see what is possible on these very streets. And how can we accommodate all these different road users on our streets? Our pedestrians who are not just the able or aged men, but also people on wheelchairs and children and families. Also cyclists of all ages and abilities, our transit riders, formal and informal, our two and four wheeler motorists, our freight operators and service providers, and often the users who get left out, the people doing business on our streets. We have been applying lessons from the Global Street Design Guide across these five cities, and I will use that as a basis to show you how to collect metrics and evaluate your street projects going forward. Now, when talking about metrics and evaluation, we often go back to Michael Bloomberg and his famous quote, which says, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. And that is something very important for all our city projects. Looking into it, we need to see what is the evaluation that we need to do. We need to evaluate our projects way beyond just the amount of money spent on it, but to also understand how much did the crashes fall? Did that impact the commercial viability of that locality? Do the people prefer the new configuration at that intersection or along that corridor? And it's important because people often forget how it was before. It helps make a case for projects to scale that up across the city. Many a times we have various local designers or engineers who are not on board bold ideas and evaluating a project shows them that it is possible. And it allows many more people to get inspired by, but also to learn lessons from failures and evolve into better solutions. But the first thing we need to do is shift how we measure success. 
Globally, we have been measuring success based on automobile safety, the number of flyovers we've built, highways we've built, but that needs to shift. And the new lens for evaluating our streets and our cities needs to be access and mobility, the public health and safety, the quality of life we offer to the citizens, the economic vitality, the equity that our streets provide for people. And this example from New York City at Times Square is a great piece to show that it is possible on the busiest streets around the world to change them and to measure them. And the biggest piece that shows the success is the people, the people using these streets. We often forget what we need to measure beyond just the capital in investment or the number of kilometers of road that has been built. And the Global Street Design Guide talks about some of these. It talks about the physical and operational changes that we can measure such as the length and width of the new improved sidewalks in our project, the added length of cycle facilities or dedicated transit facilities in each corridor that is being redesigned, or even the improved signal timing or the length of the pedestrian crossing, which therefore reduces the risk of exposure. We should also me measure the changes in use and activity, such as the shift in the mode share, how many people took to cycling after a cycle lane was built? Did it change any mobility activities in the corridor? Did it change user preferences? Did it reduce vehicular speeds, making people feel safer on those corridors? And of course, we have to measure the long-term resulting impact, such as the KSIs, the air quality, and the carbon emissions along those corridors or neighborhoods which are being transformed. Now, some of these need to be measured before and after a project is completed. Some need to be measured over time, periodically after one, three, six or 12 months. And of course, the long-term impacts need to be measured over a couple of years. After understanding what to measure, it's important who to measure because this is what we have been measuring traditionally. The number of cars that pass through an intersection, the number of cars on our streets, but we often forget about the people walking on those streets. The cyclists, the people taking transit, the people walking to work. And so we need to shift from measuring only one user to becoming much more inclusive, quantitative, qualitative, and contextual about our metrics and evaluation systems. And finally, coming to how to measure all of these users. We need to clarify our priorities. Before every project, we need to understand what are we trying to demonstrate by the project? Are we trying to understand the number of people? Are we trying to convince people for a new change? Are we trying to address the people going to school and to work? Or the people who are actually violating the street design while sitting in their motor vehicles? Is it the elderly or the families taking transit each day who we are trying to address? Or the people who are being forced to walk on the roadbed because of a narrow sidewalk, despite huge commercial activity all across the street? Second, once we know the priority is identifying the metrics that help tell that story and make the case. The first example here is showing that the pedestrians are at risk and people are dying because they're being forced to walk on the roadbed. And so we need to start measuring the peak pedestrian volumes on the weekdays. We need to measure how many people are walking outside these sidewalks uh, each day during the peak hour and make a case for all those people at risk. Similarly, talking about the inequitable use of space, when a large number of people are actually pedestrians on that corridor, but majority of the space has been given to cars and buses, and how we can actually repurpose that space and prioritize the pedestrians. We often need to go out and understand from people how they feel on the streets and need to share their stories 
talk about how safe or unsafe they feel walking on those sidewalks. And after understanding these metrics, we need to pick the ones with the highest potentials. The metric where we can show the greatest change, the extreme condition, and have the largest impact. Each of these metrics have to be measured at different points of time, as I mentioned earlier, some around a few days, some at intervals of months, and some for a couple of years. And the types of interventions which will define this are pop-ups, interim projects, or capital construction. While pop-ups might last for a day or two, interims can be for a couple of months or a year to, and help measure the long term. And of course, capital construction, while not only allows you to measure immediate changes, but also long-term impact. And so it's important to create a timeline, a timeline to collect these metrics at each stage of the project, before the pop-up, before the interim, after the interim transformation, and how periodically after the capital construction. Now coming to the power of paint and interim transformation, it's important before that we understand how we can measure change through a pop-up event through one example of this project in Sao Paulo, where this large roundabout with confusing movement for all road users put all the pedestrians at a huge risk. And with a simple lick of paint, it was transformed into a much more organized, safe and playful and inviting part of this neighborhood. Before the transformation, 6% of the people were walking outside a safe facility and the others were also crammed. But after the transformation, not only did this improve, but we also saw that the throughput of the number of cars increased despite slower speeds which made this intersection safer, not just for the pedestrians, but also for the automobile users. People who felt extremely unsafe in the neighborhood while walking these streets started to feel much safer while walking on the extended sidewalks. And these metrics showed that the project impacted all users qualitatively and quantitatively. But these metrics are not enough until they communicate it successfully. And this example of a project in Fortaleza where this large neighborhood street was reclaimed for the people showed how that data was transformed and how it was used to communicate the success to the people. From 21%, 73% people started using the space. 94% of the people who were surveyed approved of the intervention and a very large number believed that pedestrians needed to be prioritized here. And these are the kinds of messages that need to be circulated around. So some of the often myths that people have or the arguments we receive are that narrowing the vehicle lanes as part of these projects will cause congestion. But it's important to explain the concepts of traffic evaporation and induced demand by using this data to people, where we can see that when you narrow lanes, some of the people continue to use that street, while many others choose other modes of transport, sometimes not even take that trip or get diverted onto other routes. People often complain that they don't have enough budget, but New York City showed that between 2007 and 2012, out of their $6 billion budget for roads, bridges, and infrastructure, only 1% was used to build over 23 plazas and a couple hundred kilometers of bike lanes across the city. And this is exactly the kind of power that we need to leverage to show that streets can change now and leverage these interim interventions through a series of projects, whether pop-ups, interims, or capital projects. And it's a very simple recipe. Just some paint, traffic cones, a very dedicated and set timeline, and a huge bunch of stakeholders and volunteers. 
So just a few snippets to show the kind of pieces that can show change. Planters, barricades, bright colors, seating and tables to program the space, umbrellas to make it comfortable, and bringing in the kiosks and the business owners. And of course, the people who can be local academic groups, community groups, volunteers, or even the city staff to work together. The site selection should be a scale that can be managed, but can still have an impact. Something which the city prioritizes, but also the neighborhood. It's important to plan ahead. And so holidays and timelines need to be checked. Materials need to be bought. Staff support needs to be planned. And drawings and other things need to be done. But something which often gets left out is letting the community know that change is happening in their neighborhood is important. So flyers, posters, community sessions are important. Who could be the partners? Apart from the local residents and businesses, the police, the local NGOs, universities, schools, artists, and as well as the media who will communicate the success of these projects. And then, of course, collecting the metrics based on the parameters explained earlier in the presentation. Programming is a great way to activate these spaces, to bring attention, to make people understand how their roadbed can be used better. And of course, a plan to implement it. Why are these uh, interim projects so powerful? Because just like this, uh, illustration, we often know that everyone wants to see change, but very few want to change themselves. And interim projects allow us to see quick change at a low cost and see what is possible because it's faster. Like this project in Sao Paulo showing how this entire intersection was made extremely safe for all the road users with narrowing the lane width, directing traffic, adding more direct and shorter pedestrian crosswalks and a few traffic calming measures. And that completely changed the space. And now this is being scaled up across the entire neighborhood. This intersection at Lagar in Ethiopia saw the complete transformation from this being the before condition to a pop-up and then an interim for six months and is now a permanent installation in the city and has inspired over 30 more intersections to reduce the crossing distances for the people, add refuge islands and slow turning vehicles down. Interim projects are important to show what's possible, like this project I showed earlier from Fortaleza where people could never have imagined that the traffic movement on the street could continue despite so much space being reclaimed for the people. And people feeling safer resulted in the local community actually going to the political authorities to make this a permanent feature. This project in Mumbai at Mitchoki showcased how the space could be safe, made safer and still maintain the same throughput of vehicles through just aligning the corners and taking up the underutilized roadbed, which allowed cars to weave through each other, cause congestion and speed, making it extremely unsafe for pedestrians. And it is very low cost with very high impact. Like this project we worked upon in the school zones in Bogota, where just by using chalk overnight, next morning we were made, able to ensure that all the kids walking to school were safe. All the parents felt safer letting their children walk to school. And this was done without impacting the vehicular traffic on these corridors. Or th and that small intersection has led to catalyzing much more change in the city of Bogota, like this giant roundabout, which was transformed recently. Again, using the same principles in, of the Global Street Design Guide and the toolkit of interim transformation. 
And the biggest piece supporting all of this has been the data in each project, which has been used project after project to convince the city authorities to go bolder, bigger, and better. And finally, they help engage the community. They make the community feel like they're part of it, that their voices are heard. And it goes back to the primary piece, which is to put people first in the planning of the project, in the implementation of the project, as well as the use of the project. So with that, I would like to end my presentation and thank you and hope that all of you can measure your projects, manage your projects, and scale them into bigger, bolder versions to create safe and sustainable cities. Thank you.